if you don't mind. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Um, and I'd like to hand it off to Alfredo to introduce our distinguished speaker. Okay. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm very happy that most of the department and most of my analysis course is here. Hopefully there are some other people. Well, for me, it's a pleasure uh, to introduce Gustavo Ponce. Uh, Gustavo uh, is uh, a very important mathematician. Uh, he got the, his bachelor's degree in 1976 at Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, of course, he's much older than me. <laughs> Uh, and then he, he went to the Quran, Quran Institute of Mathematical Science in New York and graduated master degree in 1980 and then in PhD degree in 1982 under the supervision of Sergio Kleinerman and also uh, to under Lois Norenberg. That's according to, to Wikipedia, even though Gustavo always get, get mad when I say that. Uh, he was a visiting lecturer at the University of California at Berkeley from 82 to 84, assistant professor at Universidad Central. He went back to Venezuela for two years, 84, 86. Then he went, he came to the University of Chicago from 86 to 89, and then associated professor at Pennsylvania Penn State University. And since 1991, he is at the University of California at Santa Barbara. He has been visiting professor in quite a few important institutions. Uh, uh, he has, uh, according to the math signet, has 126 publications. Uh, and an amazing total number of citations of 7,694. He has uh, uh, 45 co-authors, 104 joint publications, <laughs> according to the math I net. And there is a, a famous uh, collaboration with Carlos Kenny that also was a speaker in the Roosevelt Lecture in Math. Um, back in, in uh, 2018, and uh, and uh, Luis Vega from the University of uh, the Basque Country. And so that's a, there is a quite a few series of paper. The uh, Eni Ponce Vega, right? KPV, KPV. Uh, so his main area uh, of uh, study is partial differential equations, but I mean, he is a specialist in uh, working in the application of harmonic analysis uh, to to partial differential equation in the in the uh, spirit of uh, Alberto Cadell. So for me again, it's a pleasure to introduce. Uh, Gustavo, and he is going to talk about the, on the Cauchy problem for the K generalized cotton debris equation, the famous KDV equation. Gustavo, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, first, thank you for the invitation to all of you, and thank you for the introduction for Wilfredo. It's a pleasure to, to talk in the Roosevelt University and to be in Chicago. And it's a kind of risky business to give a talk on the KDV equation in Chicago. You have uh, Carlos Kenny there and you have Jerry Bona that can give you a much better talk about this. But since both of them, I have written paper and learned from them, then I think that I can try my best to say something new to you. Okay, then as Many talks in the KDV, they have to start with Scott Russell and they have to start with this paragraph that I will not read to you because if I read that to you, you will not understand. But if you read it, I will stop here. This part, this is a famous statement that is the beginning of the 
soliton or the traveling way things. And I will stop for one minute or two minutes for you to read that. Did we finish? Yeah. Oh, okay. Then he made this observation in the middle of the 19th century. And then he was an engineer and he made the following experiment. Suppose that this is the transversal channel. And this is the red is the water level. When there is no motion, this is a gate here. You open the gate and this create a bump that is the bond that he observed. And then the bump travel. And then he, at the end, when the travel at the end of the channel, he closed that gate and recover all the water that was at the beginning accumulated here. Then also Russell observed that in this case, the amplitude let's call it A, was exactly proportional to the velocity. He checked that the velocity and the amplitude of the way are related. Then he did this experiment. This is next, the next experiment is this one. You put now the same channel. This is the water level. So you have no movement and you create a put a lot of water. When you do that and you open this gate, that create two bump because there isn't too much water to travel with only one step and this bump of A, the rule that the velocity is related with the amplitude. And in that case, the first bump coming from the right is higher than they tend to go like this. We travel with C1, C2, C2 larger than C1, they start to separate. Then I don't, I'm not sure if he did this experiment, but it's almost certainly that he, then he tried to do the opposite. He tried to put the big wave behind the short wave. Then to do that, you do the following. This is the level of the water. When you have no movement, then you put here this amount of water, and then you put more water here. Then you open that. Oh, okay. Then I have to add one page. I'm sorry. I will have to add one page here. Okay. Then you opened the first gate. Then you have this bump, but still you have this. 
Then you open the second gate. Then you create this, sorry, big, oh Jesus. We're in the situation where the second bomb is bigger, but it's behind. And then this velocity is bigger than this one. And in some moment, the big wave get together with this, that one. And then a later time, the picture look like this. This is C2, this is C1. This amplitude is exactly this A2. And this amplitude here, A1, is the same that here. That means that they pass, the big one surpass, the small one, they get together here, like ignoring any interaction. Well, this is almost true, it's not true. There is some more interaction, but the shape doesn't change. Then you use when you, this is to say that the collision between this traveling way is elastic. That means that they don't affect the shape when they get together. I think that Scott Russell did all this experiment, but he didn't deduce the equation. Right? Then, since he didn't deduce the equation, then this in this was a Scott Russell. Then Boosin X in the 60s, they do the equation. But equation with models, this Wave propagation. But he made that with many other equations. And then it was in this year that Gorter with De Vries, two Dutch engineers, they do the equation that is this one. But Bosinus equation was different? No, it was the same, but the problem is that he put many equations at the same time, right? He didn't distinguish, right? And then no, no, nobody paid too much attention to that. It was Katie, the Cortevide de Vries, the post in the paper, that deduced that and proved that this model, the traveling wave in the right, as in the experiment of Russell, and gave a lot of reference to that. Right? I don't I don't think that they knew the result of Business. Oh okay. Okay. Then what we are going to consider today is this equation. We are going to consider what it's called decay generalized Corte V de Vries, this is too long, we write it like this. K is because you have this power here, K, that can be one, two, three. And most of the lecture is about what is, the, how the nonlinearity affect. In the, in the original one, K was one? In the, yes, KDV is one. This is Scott Russell is boosting X and then KDV is K equal one. 
k equal to is called a modify kdv. And if you put k equal to three, four, and five, it doesn't appear as a model. It appears as a mathematical model that you want to study, but not as a physical model. Then k equal one, k equal two are physical model. What, what is the meaning for k equal two? It's also a wave propagation. It appears also when you want to study the how some fluid, I mean, flow of curve move accordingly to the, the interaction of vortex. I mean, if you have vortex curve, like this, if you have the uh, curve that is the center, let's say, of a tornado, right? And you want to model this, it's a physical models. But you will see that this is a more for the mathematical thing. And you will see that this is very interesting here. Okay. Okay, then the KDV is very famous. In fact, in 1995, there was a 100 year celebration. in Amsterdam. It was a big conference about that. And then you're going to say, why is it so famous? Well, it's famous also mainly because the following result. In 1967, Garner, Green, Kruskal, and Mura proved the following. Okay, and now we have to talk about spectral theorem and all these things. Suppose that you consider the following ODE. You put the second derivatives, you multiply the function that you take the second derivatives, and you look for the uh, eigenvalues of this operator. This operator depends of Q, that is a potential, right? then you are in the full domain and if q were not there the spectrum of this operator will be all the positive real numbers this operator will be self adjoint it will be positive and this will be the spectrum in the generalized sense because it's, they are not eigenvalues called continuous spectrum, but then don't, we will not go very deep into spectral theory because I'm not the right person for that. Okay. Okay. If we put a Q, a potential there and Q have a property decay, then the spectrum is some kind of perturbation of the case where you have zero here, then it will be the real line positive part plus some negative numbers. And these negative numbers that are finitely many are real eigenvalues in the appropriate sense. They have eigenvector and all this. Okay. What they observe, Ruskar, Mura, Garner, and Green, is the following. Okay, and I have to erase this three because it's not there. Then if you take a solution of the KDV, and you put it as a potential, when t is a parameter, x is the variable that where you're going to work in the, in the equation, then you have this equation. Sorry, that's not second derivative here. There is no second derivative. Mm -hmm. So you take the solution of the KDV as the potential Q. Yes, and of course T doesn't have anything to do with the equation because every the, we are working with the equation in, in, the, in the variable X. Right. Then you came out that you compute the spectrum and the spectrum is independent 
of the time. That means you are computing the spectrum and if the solution depends, is a, I mean, if you have a solution of the KDV, when you move the potential, the spectrum doesn't change. That is, this is very strange. It's like, suppose that you solve an ODE that takes values in matrices and the matrix is moving and the eigenvalues of the matrix doesn't move with the time, right? It will be the same situation. You solve an ODE, right? That the solution have to do with a matrix and the when you move the in, in the other parameter T, the spectral doesn't change. Then they, with this, they allow to do the following. And this is a pure spectral problem. If you give me uh, the spectrum, right? Then you can, given the spectrum, you compute, I mean, given the potential, I'm sorry, given the potential, you compute the spectrum, you compute something that is called the normalized coefficient, and you compute something that have to do with the continuous spectrum that is called the reflected coefficient. This is the spectrum. This has to do with the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. This has to do with the continuous spectrum. If you give me Q, you know how to compute these three things. The important part is that if you know how to compute these three things, you can go back. You can reconstruct the spectrum. I mean, from the spectrum, this quantity and this quantity, you can reconstruct the potential. And now, suppose that you take a solution of the KDV, the spectrum doesn't change. This normalized coefficient chain in a trivial way, solve an ODE, and these reflected coefficients chain in a trivial way that solve an ODE. That means that if you put as a potential the initial data of your KDV, you compute this quantity, you evolve this quantity that the spectrum doesn't change, this chain in a normal, very simple form, this chain in a simple form, then you apply the inverse spectral problem and then you recover. But, uh, uh, hold it, but the, the, for the inverse problem, I mean, the, the equation for the normalized coefficient and the reflected coefficients, I mean, you, you mentioned there are ordinary differential equations that you Yes. Use. But... Uh, that so, means that if you know that at the time zero, you can know that at the time t. Okay. Then the graph is this. You give me the initial data. Right? I. I plug this initial data as a potential mm -hmm. here. I evolve in time the spectrum doesn't, if, if I have a solution of the KDV, the spectrum doesn't change. The normalized coefficient, I know which are the normalized coefficient, they should be a time t, and the reflected coefficient at time t. And now I apply the inverse and I know the solution at time t. Then I can solve the PDE without going to the PDE. Then this is a linear, all these are linear problem, all these are linear problem. Then you, by a collection of linear problem, you were able to solve the KDV without passing to the, P, to the PDE at all. You are solving some simple ODE. And this is called, this method is called the inverse scattering method. Then this inverse scattering method, this is called the first equation that obeyed that was the KDV. That's the reason why the KDV is so famous. Then they also prove, Ruskal, Green, Garner, and Mura prove that if K is equal to two, there is another spectral problem that give you the solution without having to do with the equation. They also prove that if you have the KDV, if you have a solution 
of the modified KDB. And you do this transformation. This B solve the KDB. That means that the modified KDB and the KDB are related. This information is complex, but that's okay. It's called the mirror transformation. Then there are other equations that are integrable. There are plenty of integrable models. They are so called Benjamin Ono. Sam Gordon equation. These are one dimensional. Then you're going to ask the question that you have two dimensional mm -hmm. integrable models. Yes, there are some. For example, the cubic NLS. Yeah, hold it, hold it. What is what are the what are those integrable models? Okay, for example, let's say if n equal to one, you take this. You can solve this by a modification of the inverse category. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right? And this is called the cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. This was the, no, the second equation that was that you can solve with- Why is cubic? Phenomenon. I don't see a power of three. No, this, okay. No, the first one was the KDV. Right. The second one was the modified KDV that you have power three here. Yes, yes. Okay. The next one was the Schrodinger equation that is also cubic, mm -hmm. right? The, right, but is, then the question is, all these models are in one dimension. X is in Rn. In Rn was n equal to one. Then there are some models in R2, okay? That are integrable. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is a very exceptional cases that you have equations that are completely integrable that you can't solve like this. Okay, this is not, most of the equations you cannot solve it like this for a spectral to reduce as a sequence of linear problem. Okay, any question with Fredo? Did you ask me a question? So we for, are all talk these more about the models, for those integrable models, you can do the, the, the inverse scattering. That is, you start with an eigenvalue problem, you find the spectrum and those, these other quantities, you have yes. time and then you go back. Yes, but the, spec but the spectral problem is not so simple like, like the one in the KDB. It's much more complicated. Depending on the, the equation, it will be more complicated, right? It will be, it's not so elegant like the second derivatives plus the, the potential multiplier. Yeah, but, but the, could you put the eigenvalue problem, the, the eigenvalue problem that they related with the KDB? Mm -hmm. So uh, where is the question? No, but the question is, I mean, the question was, was not- This one. Yeah. The question was not, uh, I mean, was a chance that, you know, you, it happens that if you put the solution of the KDV, you get an independent of the, of time spectrum. Well, it was not, it, they have some, they, they have some result due to Ulan years before that give you the feeling that something of that should be true. Okay. Uh, the, 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 I mean, it's, it's amazing this discovering, but they have some feeling about some, some experiment, Bursak and Bursak did some experiment of this source, right? In the Toda flow and things like that. I'm not the person, I'm the right person to talk about inverse scattering. I try not to say more. 
And for the other integrable system, how do you get the the the, the eigenvalue problem? I mean, well, it can be it can be matrix. For example, for the for the cubic NLS is going to be something that has to do with matrices. It's much more complicated. It's a system. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 Then let's go back to our question that is this one. Then we got the K generalized KDV is this one. Okay, if k is equal to one and two, and then you are completely integrable, in particular, you have infinitely many conservation law. You satisfy that the integral of the solution is independent of the time. That means that is this, you call it this mass, the L2 is preserved. This quantity, the derivatives of, a square plus this quantity, if k is equal to one in the KDV will be a cube, right? Is preserved. You have infinitely many of these conservation law. But if you have k is any positive number, you still have all three. For example, for k equal to three, four, five, six, seven, you have that this quantity is preserved. This quantity is preserved independent of who is k. This quantity is independent of who is k here, but this quantity depends on who is k. And if k is equal to one and two, you have a lot more conservation law, but if k is three, four, five, you get up to here and that's it. Okay. Then why do you care about this conservation law? Because if, when you have now the power, remember that we are in this power, I'm going to write this equation, Plenty of time. Hmm. Now the K start to make a difference. And this is a key of, of, the, of the, what we want to emphasize in the talk. If K is equal to one, two or three, and you start with a initial data that is a smooth, you use this quantity to prove that your solution will be as smooth as initial data if you measure that in the appropriate way. That means that globally, the solution of this equation, globally, the solution of this equation when k is equal to one, two, three, is okay. You don't have no problem. If you start with a nice data, doesn't matter if it's big or small, but nice in appropriate space, then the solution state as nigh as initial data if k is equal to one, two, or three. What happens if k is four? Well, if k is four, we will see that if you are larger than the traveling way that correspond to that, that we will go there in a moment, you are going to prove it's a result of Mar Merle and Martel and later was improved by Merle, Martel, and Rafael that if initially you are larger than this function that it will appear in the next slice, then you can start very with a lot of regularity and in finite time, you will stop being C1. Then when K is equal to one, two, three, you start with a very nice data, you stay with a very nice data, but the solution will be very nice for all time you have no problem. You have global system. If K is equal to four, then you can start, if you start with data that is larger than this fixed function that we will see, then in finite time, you will stop being so nice and you will not be even C1. And then you ask the question, what happened with five, six, and seven? Well, nobody knows. And this is very strange because the, the issue is, if you have a higher nonlinearity, then the small thing becomes small and the big thing becomes larger. Then if, you, if something goes wrong with four, it will be wrong with five, six, and seven, right? I mean, things become, start to be bigger. Remember that 
in some the amplitude and the speed, all, all these are related. Mm -hmm. Then, then the blows up of the solution might mean that the blows up mean that you start with something that is nice and infinite and you are not C1 in this case. Then in this, in this setting, it has been proved only for k equal to four. What, is, what are those two stars in the inequality, Gustavo? Is it just a typo or what? No, is that the, I have to make a remark that this is open. Okay, I have to talk about that this is open and to say that this is a strange because if you have higher order of nonlinearity, then the nonlinearity to control the business, right? You are, you are asking for a solution that is not a small and you put larger power since become more, I mean, if four is bad, five should be worse and so forth, but this is not the case. At least it's not so simple to prove K equal to five, six and D, this is open. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's strange, and that is the first is the first moment at, that we will see a lot. But the power k here play a role. Then, if k is equal to one and two, you are integrable. If k is equal to one, two, and three, and you are initially are nice, then the solution will be nice forever. If k is equal to four and you are larger than this function you will become, you are not nice after finite time. And if k is equal to five, six and so on, then if you start nice, you locally stay nice and nobody knows what happened for a long time. In the wrong order. Okay. Then this is the first question that we have. Okay, let's, let's compute the traveling way that is exactly what Scott Russell tried to compute, okay? Okay. Okay, and let's let's go backwards. And you want suppose that we write instead of write f of u equal to u k plus one k plus one. We write it in general. If we consider this equation. And we're looking for solutions that are traveling way that means that it's a function that depends on only one variable that move to the right with a speed c and this q is a positive this q is, go is going to depend of course q is going to depend of the velocity and the k that you are considering here but this is general, you don't have to put power, it can be any nonlinearity, but we are concentric with power. Mm -hmm. And then we want to find solution of this form, that means that all the partial derivatives will become normal derivatives and you will have an ordinary differential equation. And you put this boundary value is that at infinity, your traveling weight should be zero, the derivative should be zero, the second derivative should be zero. Then if you substitute, this answer in this setting, you are looking for solution of this or the e. Right? The derivatives in t is one derivatives, the derivatives in x is three derivatives. You have a c coming out and you have this. And since you have the boundary values here, you are looking for solution of this problem. And this is a naughty e. And then you say, well, let's say too ambitious, let's fix our nonlinearity to be remembered that our nonlinearity is going to be uk dx of u that is equal to the derivatives of x of f of u. We look for this nonlinearity. And if you have a good table of integral, you will find that the solution is equal to this. Okay, let's analyze this. Okay. Okay, if k is equal to one, this is the k dv, and you have that the solution is going to be some constant that is, in this case is three, half, I mean, three, only three. See that is the velocity, the hyperbolic secant, and then the square of a square root of two over two, 
C. This is for the KDV, and this solution looks like this. Look exactly like the observation. The graph of this is this. And the velocity, the speed, is equal to C, that is exactly equal to the amplitude. This is exactly what, what Russell observed. Then if K is equal to two, then you have a you have a power two here, but you have this, and then you have not a hyperbolic secant square, you have the hyperbolic secant. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, and if K is larger, then you have to have a, you always look, so it looked like a bomb with different power, but look like a bomb. Okay, then let's, before we go, let's discuss the existence of this. This is a traveling way that you are looking for. And this solution is a solution of the KDV, but it's a, but that cannot be a solution of one part of the KDB. Okay, let me write what I mean. If you take a only the linear part of this equation, and you consider the linear part, the linear part trying to make the solution smoother and smaller. In particular, for example, you can prove that the supremum of the derivatives decay in time if the initial data is in L1. But if you take solution of the nonlinear part with the same, with a data, and the data is not strictly increasing, then you see that there exists a finite time where this C1, the function stop BC1 in finite time. Then you see that they, the linear part is working in one direction and the nonlinear part is working in the opposite direction and the equilibrium is this one because this one doesn't decay and doesn't grow when time moves. It doesn't, it's exactly the equilibrium between these two. Right? And this is what we prove there. This, you have this existence of the traveling way. And if you parameterize, you can parameterize the following, you can do the following scaling argument. You have a solution of the generalized KDV, then if, since every, all the terms are homogeneous, then you put a lambda, any lambda positive, and you have a family of solution that depend on the parameter lambda, right? That have to do with the power k here. And if you consider the traveling wake for this power k, you will see that you have a general form of this form. This is your general form. And then you see that The, this, the, the velocity is equal to this. And the amplitude is equal to this. That means in the case of the KDV is the only moment that the amplitude is equal to the velocity in the other moment is a power, okay? Okay, then let's stay with the traveling wave. Then we have a solution of the travel. I mean, we have solutions that look of, doesn't matter who is K, they, this is the initial profile and they travel with a speed C and the pen of K, and the amplitude is related with pattern of K. Then you ask the question, if initially, Your data mm -hmm. is close to one of these traveling ways. You, you, you fix K. Fix. 
And you say, suppose that initially I am close to this in some node. What happened? So UX0 is the initial that. The, yes. So you are saying the, the you're comparing the initial data with the traveling wave. Yes, and you want to know, you want to know if they stay close. Oh, I see. Okay. Then you want to know if you stay close to the traveling way. Well, the, as if you ask that question, right? Let me add one more page. If we add that question, okay, we have a problem because that it cannot be ha cannot happen because you can have a traveling way. Suppose that C1 is larger than C2, K is fixed. Then you have a traveling way like look like this. You have to do with C1. And you have a traveling way like look like this. That has to do with C2. Then initially they may be close, but at later time, the velocity is different differ and then they don't have anything to do with each other. Then you cannot ask the question like this. This is too general. Then the question is, this has to be re doing this way. Suppose that initially, the initial data is this, Suppose that initially you are so close in a H1, H1, F in H1 is the L2 north of F and the L2 north of the derivatives of F. Then the question is, if you start close to the initial data at later time, then is the solution translated close to the traveling way, then in this case that we have here, it will be the case because when you translate it, you cannot superpose at this is initial condition, right? Then the question is if initially I am close to a traveling way, a later time I am close to a translation of the traveling way. I, take, I have to take the, there exists a translation that depends of the time for all time, to give me the time and I, there exists a translation, this function depends on the time, such that I am close. The answer of this is yes, if k is equal to one, two, three, and the answer is no, if k is equal to four, five, six. That means that if you start with the KDB or the modified KDB of the nonlinearity, Three, that is u3 dx u, and you start close to a traveling way initially, a later time you will be close to a translation of the traveling way. But if you start with a power four, five, and six, the answer is no. Okay, that was proved by Bruce Benjamin, Kazenaf, Leon, Michael Weinstein, Grilaki, Shata, Strauss, Martel, Merle, Bona, Suganide, Strauss. Okay. Then you can see that the power have a very strong influence of the long time behavior. Remember that you have global solution for nice data if you are one, two, three. You have no, lo, then you have nice solutions that blows off in finite time if you are four, and this is open five, six, seven, and so forth. Okay, in the last five minutes, I would like to talk about. The following. Suppose that we have, we talk about the two soliton. Suppose we, we talk about this situation when we have the 
one traveling way like this and one traveling way like this. And we will say, why do you, this will tell you why do you call sometimes soliton and sometimes you call it traveling wave. Okay. Well, by using the inverse scattering, you have the explicit solution of the two soliton. If you are in the case of the KDV and you graph this function, it will come to something like this, right? In, when, you are, when you are moving around this quantity, you value is 40A. When you move around this part, your value is 12. And globally, you behave this way. These are two traveling waves. Remember that the second square mm -hmm. is the traveling wave mm -hmm. for that. Then you have these two soliton, and you can see that graphically, if you put t, t minus infinity or t plus infinity, they look, they pass against each other and they look totally elastic. And of course, there is a small, this number is have to be there because when, you, when they collide, they lose a little bit of the tra in the translation. I mean, it's not true that this is a solution, this is a solution, and the addition is a solution. No, there is this factor here say, this is a solution, it's a solution, and that when they cross, they are not exactly in the same place that they should be if they were by themselves. Okay. Do that make sense? So you are you have, you have like kind of a, a correction of the traveling way. Yes, uh, of the interaction, but they don't lose the high of each of them. They only lose the position they, that they should be if they were by themselves. And what, what what is the, the is there any interpretation? Well, the interpret the only thing that I know is that I mean this by itself. This by itself is, you, is a solution. This yes. by itself is a solution. Yes. But the question is not linear. It's not true that if you have two solutions, the sum of them is a solution, right? Then when you multiply, there is a something that the sum of the solution is a solution only if there is, you take interaction in, in there. What about the, that log three? Over two, is there that, that is the phase that you have? The phase. Okay. Okay. Let's let's see what happened when you have. Remember that we have we have traveling way of this four and traveling way of this four for any k. Then for k equal to one, we have explicit that these interact and they are totally elastic. The solution is totally elastic as you can observe in the lab, like Scott Russell did. What happened if K is equal to two? If K is equal to two and you have two traveling waves, one with a speed C1, one with a speed C2, then the solution is going to look like the traveling way, the other traveling way, and a quantity that goes to zero at infinity, in plus infinity and minus infinity. That means that the collision between these two traveling way is elastic because it doesn't matter where do you start, one is right when they, they will interact and they will not lose the high in any case. But there is this extra term, the eta x e. Yes. There is this term, but this term disappear. See, if, if t is equal to minus infinity, the order, the order of these two quantities change when you travel from t to minus infinity and t. One will be to the right, one will be to the left. When you evolve, they switch. And this quantity is very small and decay to zero at infinity. That means that in minus infinity, you see these two traveling waves and plus infinity, you see these two traveling way in a different in different location, one pass to the other, right? Then the interaction is elastic. We will say that in this case, the interaction is elastic. Does that make sense? What is an elastic intera interaction between traveling wave? 
Is that okay, Wilfredo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that okay. is not the case if k is equal to three. Okay, that is a little bit more complicated, but let's do it. Then k equal to three is not integrable. Integrable is k equal to one and k equal to two, right? Then suppose that you take two traveling wave for k equal to three, such that C1 is much larger than C2. And you at minus infinity, you see the traveling wave, the other traveling wave, and a quantity that is very small. This is what you see at minus infinity. What happened when at infinity, what do you see? You see that your traveling wave have a speed that is not C1, it's a C1 that depends of time. The second traveling wave have a speed that depends of time. And mm -hmm. this speed, when T goes to infinity, approach some value that is larger than the initial one that you have. That means that the big one gain high and gain a speed. The small one loses speed. Then the interaction is not elastic. Right? Then when k is equal to t, that is not integrable, you can have two solitons that they interact, but then when they interact, they lost the amplitude. One, the bigger one will, will get higher, the small one will get smaller, right? Asymptotically, they convert it to that, and then, but they change. It's not elastic. They don't have the same speed. Okay. And this is a, I mean that, and then you can ask what happened if K is equal to four, five, six, and seven? Well, you cannot do it because you don't know that you have global existence. Then this analysis doesn't, cannot be carried out because you don't know that you have global existence. I mean, the results say if you are a little bit higher than in K equal to four of the traveling way Q4, then you blows up in finite time then you, you don't know that global system exists like this. Okay, can I advertise the something to, for the second talk? Yes. Yeah. I have to stop. Well, advertise that. Okay, okay, then we have discussed traveling wave and we have discussed the interaction between traveling wave and you call soliton when the if the traveling wave interact elastic, then only when k is equal to one and two, you call the traveling wave soliton. If mm -hmm. k is equal to three, four, and five, you call this traveling wave because they don't interact as elastic. Okay, that's the reason the notation. Okay. Then, okay, then it came out that you have some very weird solutions. Okay, I will go to the, okay. If k is equal to two, okay, then this is an advertise we will go. This is if k is equal to two, then the modified KDV have a solution of this form. Explicit solution. And then let me write how the solution look like. I have to, okay. How this solution look like? If, okay, you have a lot of parameters, that's a problem, but okay, alpha and beta are free parameters, but suppose that you choose alpha and beta such that this quantity is zero. This quantity is what you have here. That means that you have the hyperbolic secant because you have the cosine hyperbolic in the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. You are going to take the derivatives of that and so forth. Then this is multiplied by the sine. Then when this quantity, is equal to zero, then you have a solution that look like this. It's hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic secant, but it have a sign. That means that it's oscillating. Mm -hmm. And it's not moving. The oscillation is moving, 
with time, this doesn't move with time. Then it's a solution that is periodic in time. This solution is periodic in time, right? Mm -hmm. But only the, the top part is periodic in time. The bottom part that is a hyper, that gives you this hyperbolic second is not. Mm -hmm. And the solution will do this when time evolves. But, but wait, but do you see the both, both curve? Or no. The, this is the, the envelope. Oh, okay, okay. The, so, but the solution is periodic in T, okay? You don't mm -hmm. see this part. You don't see this part. Mm -hmm. Okay? You only see... And this is the envelope. Okay. Okay? Then you have this train solution that is called breeder. I mean... I have to give a talk in Mexico about this, and I didn't know how to say breather in Spanish, and I still don't know how to say that, but okay. But let's, let's see. Okay, this is something that appeared in other equation, and we are going to study in the second part of the talk. I, I will stop here, and we will start with this part for the second talk. Okay. Wow. <laughs> So this solution was obtained in 73, explicitly. Yes, explicitly, what that proof. I'm, of course, this solution, let me say more. You can adapt, you can adapt this quantity to be positive or negative. That means if this quantity is positive, you move to the right. If quantity is negative, you move to the left or the other way around, right? That means that and you can move as slow as you wish. Then you have a solution that is oscillating, that is the envelope of the hyperbolic second, move to the right or to the left or stay there and it's periodic. Okay, I think we need to stop here. Okay. Thanks to the speaker for the, this talk. So we need to have a channel and, and a horse to follow then the solitons. So, well, we will take a break for 30 minutes. So we will start at, at uh, two, Chicago at two, in Santa Barbara at 12. And uh, any question or comment? Okay. So I hope to see you again this in 30 minutes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys.